Lee Edelcourt, you are a trend forecaster working in fashion and in textiles, as well as many other industries. And you're also a publisher, an educator, a curator with me, and many things. And recently you've also become an activist. So how is the role of being a trend forecaster changing today? I think it started to change in the early 90s when we finished the 80s and we felt so guilty having been dancing day and night, spending so much money on enormous shoulders and enormous bijou, and in general being so festive and outgoing. And then there was this crash and then we felt, oh my God, we should have not have done this. And this is where the first realization of ecology and the planet you know, being in danger started to happen. So. I remember very vividly that that was a moment that suddenly you realized that you could not continue just pushing new ideas and that it became much more important to say, make less, make better, make choices and so on. And so we became quite uh, well known, I think, for helping people actually to make less product and make more money because you make more money if you make less. And, uh, but it was still only on the surface. And then we went into 2000. We thought this was going to be a completely new century, looking forward, also a bit suspicious. And then, you know, 9-11 came, which was an enormous blow. It was like an enormous entrance in this new world. And it has not sort of healed since. You know, we're going from crisis to crisis, from horror to horror, from uh, terrorism to financial crisis to now COVID. So it's, it's been a very difficult two decades. And in this period, you really became much more aware of how much the, pla the planet is in danger and how much guilt we have for all of this and how much we should really find new answers. And so, Somewhere in, I think in... 2015. Is it? 14 yeah. or 15? 14. Yeah. I, um, I could not continue to work in this field without sort of ringing the bell and say, listen, everything is wrong. We're doing the wrong things. We're going into the wrong direction. We are running into disaster. We really need to rethink the systems. And so I declared that all the systems of fashion, as we know them, and that uh, fashion was so behind the facts of other design disciplines, that it became old-fashioned. And that was the first time in my life that this beautiful profession and this beautiful field became no longer relevant. It was really bizarre. So fashion became out of fashion. Yeah. And so I wrote that manifesto, which was scary to do because we could lose all our clients after all. So I asked permission to my staff and I said, are we doing it? Yes, we do it. So we launched this and the world has not been the same for us ever since because after the video made by the business of fashion became you know, well known and went viral, it has become, I think, um, a piece of reading for all students. You know, everybody is au courant, everybody knows that this is written. So in 2015, you started to talk about the anti-fashion movement. And how did that come about? I just couldn't continue working in this field without making this paper. I felt it was dishonest not to sort of ring a bell. And so I wrote it, took me time to write in 2014. And scary because we could eventually lose all our clients. And so I asked our staff, you know, do you agree? Are we doing this? Everybody said, yes, let's do it. Everybody was on board. And so uh, we did this and then it became a very important paper after Business of Fashion Published put it. the video online, which is only part of it actually, but it it hit very hard and became viral and now I think it's reading for all students all over the world. And of course today it makes more sense even than it made then.
or Mutual Prada also used it as a keyword in one of her collections. So it became a term for everybody in the industry to think about. Yeah, I think, you know, it was a word which has, has been also, I think, historically around. But it was almost uh, more like an artist expression, but now it became a yeah, uh, household world, so. uh, word in a way. And we then um, started to do anti-fashion movements in Marseille with the students of the University of Marseille, business students, fashion business. And uh, together with uh, Stéphanie, uh, we made these um, conferences. We did four, I think. We were going to do one in New York, which we had to cancel, unfortunately. And we are gathering people together uh, to speak about good practice, to speak about new ideas, to speak with students, to sort of educate the public, to educate young people going into this field. And we see that it's a growing movement. You know, you see in all design institutions that aware young people just don't want to do fashion the way it was done. Well, they don't design garments anymore, but they often design systems. Yeah new systems for society to help people exactly. to make things in a better way, much beyond just recycling. And also incorporating the workers, incorporating the traders, incorporating even the clients. So there is a much more an idea about what we have in common. I think that is very important. And one thread that has uh, connected us throughout these 20 years of crisis, as you say, because we actually met because of 9-11. That's true. So we were brought together in chaos, but we had a lot of fun along the way. And one thing that we have been working on is our Talking Textiles initiative, which looks at the importance of textiles as a carrier of culture and also of knowledge as an endangered species. So early in your career you always put textile weavers especially from Italy on a pedestal to treat them as designers mm -hmm. as they are and you always believe that textile is like a metaphor for society yes because people um, don't even know how important textile is in fashion and unfortunately in several um, schools of fashion the textile question is never spoken about, as you know. So that's very en endangering because um, real fashion, of course, is um, dedicated to new textiles and actually couturiers and designers would create new textiles together with the industry in the good old days. And s still now, some designers still do. So. I think that textile speaks more uh, louder than volume or detail. I think it's what, what really um, designs a period also. We have periods with favorite textiles. And then often when you analyze those textiles, they sort of speak about, you know, what is the current mood, all these quilted things we have. You know, it's all because we live in fear since the beginning of this century. So. It's all still ideas of armor, you know, everything is covered and so on. And that is only going to continue. And I, often I as guess. square weaves, I guess. That happened between the 80s and the 90s. Mm. In the 80s, the favorite weave was a diagonal because it makes, it's a bit of, of a knotty weave because it makes the surface look shiny. And so it makes a bad stuff look good. And so it's deceptive, yeah, it like was, the current president. It's like the facade architecture of the 80s as well. Mm. And then we went from one day to the other through the crisis to honesty. For the first time there was the word honesty even related to uh, politics. And then we went to a one up, one down weave, square weave, which is very the most simple weave there is, actually the most basic. So people would say, maybe that's too boring, but actually it's not because it's like a canvas you can paint on, you can print on, you can embroider because it has a grid. And most important actually is when you have a square weave, you can uh, cut it on the bias. So if you want to have flair, you need to be square, which mm. is a very <laughs> interesting idea that from squareness, from some for form of organization, 
And self-control comes also this idea of being completely loose and fluid. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very beautiful metaphor. And this is why I lo love textile, because it has all these intricate little sort of secrets to tell. And do you think that this canvas weaves are going to be important as we move forward after the virus? Uh, for sure, I think honesty, and straightforwardness, and um, even tradition, and um, noble, n noble materials and noble behavior, all these sort of old-fashioned terms will be there. So I guess definitely square weave it will be part of it also because you can take the yarns out and then you have transparency you know you can let the light come in so it's it's a very beautiful simple thing for us to uh, contemplate i remember once you said to me that just when things are about to go out of fashion or when people forget about them is when they come back with a vengeance and I remember after this period of minimalism, this revival of textiles in fashion, but also in our homes, was very central around maybe 2010, 2011. Um, after that period, you started the MFA textiles at Parsons in New York. So that was very key that textiles all of a sudden came back into our lives and in, into our work. So why did you want to start such a program? Because I felt textile was such an endangered species and there was no longer that much education in material and textile and fiber. And so we needed to have at least, uh, you know, an important masters in our world so we could educate new generations of textile makers for art, theater, design, interior, fashion, you know, all fields especially also to find new ways of um, dyeing fabrics with uh, natural materials, to, you, to make bioplastics with um, seaweeds and other materials too. So it's a hybrid type of course where we uh, are mixing high tech with slow craft. And it's very interesting to see what's happening because people doing bioplastic end up doing macrame. So it looks like macrame, but it's bioplastic. This is how these two fields somehow are woven together into one new domain, which is forward looking and which is able to make smaller runs, make two measure, make two pleasure. And so it's irony because tomorrow is the graduation of my first uh, cohort of uh, students. So I had to talk to them like this. And I had to name their names like this. And it's, um, it's very bittersweet. Well, it's especially challenging to work with textile people online and yeah. on Zoom. Exactly. So they've been challenged to come up with all kinds of ways to talk about tactility and texture and hand and it's crazy. Touch. Suddenly they need to make a um, documentary about their work instead of an exhibition. Mm. So they only had sort of four weeks to turn this all around. Often small rooms, only one window, no, only phone. So they did an incredible job, I must say. You can see uh, some of the work on our Instagram. But yes, I'm so sad that I'm not physically there to say goodbye. Mm. So how does that work for your students? Because you are not seeing them either. Yeah, so I teach the trend forecasting masters at Polymoda, which is also the school where I studied in the late 90s. Lucky um, you. Yeah, it was a dream to be there. And um, well, our course, of course, in half of it is very cerebral, so you can study and reflect and think but there's also the practical side which is working with colors Color. yeah. learning about textiles but also being in florence and being inspired by all of the cultural richness that is around you which is everything from food to fabric to just natural beauty so i'm sorry that we couldn't start in spring as usual which is the best time to be in italy of course but we will be going back in October to start with a, a new bunch of international master's students. So they will, of course, be the first 
studying in this very new time frame. So I'm excited. The guinea pigs of uh, yeah, we're going to probably have to rethink the whole program and talk about um, society and fashion in particular in a very new way, which we already were talking about for a while. Uh, because of sustainability, we also discussed the anti-fashion manifesto. But now, of course, there's now going to be a real consensus, I think, about mm. change. I'm listening to several podcasts and reading open letters and articles, and most um, designers agree that it's a super chance to, on dit en français, mettre l'horloge à l'heure, mettre la pendule à l'heure. We can go back you know, and put it at zero and say, from this moment on, we are going to deliver winter in winter, summer in summer. We don't need to do three, four, five, seven small collection. One collection is enough. Uh, let us have time to sell our products. They are not made to, yeah. to be outdated in three weeks. You know, how can luxury behave as if it's fast fashion? You know, let's be luxury and. So I see that there is a very um, growing number of, um, of, of people really wanting to have change. So I'm very excited about it because this might just be the comeback of fashion as I love it. Mm. Well, already we heard from Giorgio Armani this morning, Dries van Noden also spoke up about it. So I guess that more and more people are going to jump on this new movement. Yeah, but almost everybody, you know. Uh, so American designers, uh, Mark Jacobs said something like that. Of course, uh, Stella McCarthy is completely on that page and has been there for a long time. And so everybody uh, wants to make beauty. Everybody wants to be more still. Everybody wants to have more time to create. Because the whole reason why fashion was losing it is that there was no time actually for creation. It was only time to make. It, it was all about marketing and making and... Shareholders yeah, and profits. And more, much too much shit. So, you know, what do we do with all this garment? So, it could be just an enormous renaissance, I feel. Mm. Well, renaissance is a key word, of course, for those studying in Florence because it's the center and the cradle of culture. Believe me, I did a, a Renaissance story after I visited Florence for the first time. Yeah. That was in the 80s, in the second half of the 80s. And suddenly we wanted to have tapestry and these colors and you know, I was super inspired. And, um, that was Gucci avant la lettre. On yeah. So one of our most recent initiatives is the World Hope Forum, which was in a re response to the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, do you want to explain a little bit more about why you thought it was time to help inspire change in the world through this forum? When we uh, were stuck here in South Africa, in Cape Town, where we still are after three months, we were very um, elated to see all our projects fall away. Milan didn't happen, this didn't happen, this didn't happen, this exhibit didn't happen. This client was just dormant, this client, you know, was waiting. So it was sort of like a liberation yeah. from 40 years of working day and night and weekends and so on. So I became lightheaded almost and at one point, even super happy, like a child is happy. You know, that sort of happiness, naive happiness. And so this gave us, I think, you also, right? Gave us a lot of repose in our head. There was time to think, to sleep. And you're doing your sports. Yes, kickboxing every morning. <laughs> and. Uh, I'm doing my writing, I'm writing books at this point. Well, everybody's talking about having more time to think, more time to connect, exactly. more time to be creative also. Much more in tune with your friends, with your family and so. Yeah, even almost tele telepathy and, and I guess being able to work better with your intuition. That's because we have the time. Mm. And um, because there was this sort of emptiness in our brains we could come up with something new mm. 
So suddenly I thought we need to grasp this momentum where everybody wants to change to bring together all the creative um, people of the world in design and in fashion and in travel and in food and so on. Yeah. Bring them together in a system where for once the creative people are designing not just the products but also the systems and so on so that we can bring real change to society. And so I felt what we needed to do as a sort of counter action to Davos, the World Economic Forum. Mm. Because that is always about the big money, the big players, the 1%, the banks, the politicians, always amongst themselves, sometimes talking about the world and the planet, but you know, it was always really. about yeah. money. And I think that is no longer the only leader or the only thing relevant thing. I think what is very relevant for the future is to uh, bring creativity in all fields and to bring the creative elite on the same level as uh, Politicians the money and makers economies. and so on. Yeah. And so this is what we are going to try to do, hopefully. We are going to bring people under, under the banner of hope together where we have uh, ambassadors in all countries and they will to come together, as you know. And we hope to do um, the first big um, get together in Italy next year. Maybe, maybe online, maybe real, maybe mixed. I guess mixed. Because we don't want people to travel that much anymore. So that was yeah, a very good fruit of this, um, of this virus. Yeah as many fruits, I think, will be born. There's lots of initiatives, there's a lot of things. Most important is also, I think, the people themselves, like human, humans are discovered that they are actually very human, that they really like each other, that they like their neighbors, that they like music, dance, that they like to cook, that they like to make clothes or make, you know, handicrafts. And so it has been a an emotional but wonderful journey for the world because everything which was inside people suddenly could come out. Yeah, well it's been a big year for humanity on many levels mm -hmm. and the main message of the World Hope Forum is to put people and the planet before profits. So hopefully you and many other creatives can get together and get the ball rolling. Yeah, and you because we're partners here. Yeah. I think it will happen because we get a lot of very positive reactions and also already governmental sort of organizations Bodies, yeah. who want to join us. So uh, there's a fair chance this will happen, really. And, and that it's going to be big. I think so. I feel it's... We have put ourselves into a big thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's exciting. Yeah. And uh, do you think that the importance of intuition will grow in the future for creative people? Are we going to of course. finally be more in tune with our intuition for business, for designing? I know that you've said that we're transitioning from a period of designing with fear to a period of designing from hope. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I, I believe that um, our intuition will grow if we give it more time because then we have time to listen. We had to go so fast that, you know, you have to make so many decisions in the day that you, this color or that color, you, you know, okay, let's do this, you know. And now you maybe have time that you can say, way, you know, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do actually something completely different. Uh, recently, I listened to my intuition, and that was another super example by telling you and me that we were not going to America. Mm. We, our flight was from here to go to New York and we were going to fly straight into the pandemic. <laughs> and it was not yet at all well known that it would hit New York, but I just said, you know, Philip, we're just not going. Mm. We felt giddy like kids, you know, not going to school. It was very funny, but it was the right thing to do because no matter what, we are here in this beautiful space, which is a hotel, new hotel in Cape Town. It's called Dorp, because it's like a little village. 
We're sitting in the main street of the little village, actually. Mm. We all have our own little house and we are super safe, incredibly well received. Yeah, we're completely blessed and privileged to be here. Yeah. Surrounded by amazing people as well. Absolutely. So it has been a joy, strangely. Also very painful to be so far away from everybody we know. But um, it's sort of living in paradise in, at the same time. So it's very bizarre. And with the benefit of not traveling, because this is the first time that we haven't traveled every That's week true. for three months in our whole lives. It's true. We would have made at least we would have been Milan, around the world Milan, uh, twice by yeah, now. Yeah. And so even though we will not go back to travel as it once was, and we will travel less, of course, it, this period has also made us want to get together and to travel again. So where would be the first place that you would like to go after the pandemic is over? Very personal places. I would like to go to Italy because seeing Italy empty and Italy hurt uh, was hurting us, I think, also so much because we know Italy all our lives. And um, so you just feel that you, know, you need to go there almost to pay homage. Uh, that would be one of the first things I would like to do. And then I would like to go to Morocco, where I have a house on the beach because I miss my house. Yeah. Then I would like to go to Normandy because I love, you know, the northern coast. And not, I don't want to, I don't need to go to a very far country for now. Yeah, I also have no desire whatsoever to travel anywhere mm. really, mm. apart from going to Italy so I can get back all the kilos that I lost here under the <laughs> lockdown. Did you really lose your kilos? <laughs> One or two. <laughs> okay. Travel, it will be a big question mark. I think many people will travel less. So we will travel with much more purpose. And I guess we will travel for longer periods of time. So mm. going to Tokyo for two days, I think that will not happen anymore. We no. will just do it on Zoom. Albas no, no, is, is calling us zombies. I love that, <laughs> <laughs> that word, zombie. And, um, but then if you go to, um, if you do go to Tokyo, then you might want to spend two or three weeks, go to Kyoto, see some culture. Take a sabbatical. Yeah, for sure we will study. try to do that. I hope that we're not going to fall back into the, the bad practices of the past. Well, it's for sure the world will not be the same ever again. How will be the fashion according to you? Well, of course, we've all been talking about the comforting side of fashion, reaching out to softer garments, dressing very comfortably. But um, a lot of people, I think, are also going to want to celebrate. And once they get out, they're going to go to the outdoors, to do sport, to swim to have barbecues again when they can be together. So it's, I think, also going to be, in festive. some cases, festive and, mm. and bringing people together. Yeah, I also think that um, I've never loved my clothes as much as uh, during this period of lockup. Because for the first time maybe in my life, I had time to pick the dress I need that day, which normally I never think about. And then the dress would sustain me in the day even if I was sad or, you know, or very busy or whatever. And I would combine also things differently because I had time to think about it. And I have dresses with me which are from 15 years to one year old or just bought before I left, you know, so it's mixed. But it's amazing how good they work and how... how well, they're like They're my friends, friends yeah. <laughs> And uh, we often say things the same. We often <laughs> finish each other's phrases for your information. And um, this is why it's a real duet. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been a, a real exploration of how strong a garment can be an alley. And uh, I'm going, never going to forget this. So in new choices, I'm going to be very precise to see if that garment is doing that for me. Well, if rediscovering our wardrobes and rediscovering our love for fashion can lead us to a more sustainable future, 
then I'm very glad that we have been going through this pandemic together. And uh, thank you very much for joining us on Duets. Thank you, Philip, for your friendship.